I'm Geeta Bhutani, I'm the chair of the network and I'd just like to welcome you to our fifth Psychological Professions Network. Um, and this is the fourth year of the network and I'm just delighted to welcome so many of you to this event again in what seems to be a very, very familiar venue these days. I'm not going to talk for long because we've got a really, really busy program today and I know we're probably really keen to kind of just hear from our, our sort of great speakers this morning. But just a little bit of brief what's happened in the past 12 months. So some of this will be familiar to some of you, some of it won't be. So just the network now has just under 2,500 members. I think it was 2,445 when I last looked. Um, most of us are from the Northwest. Um, the next biggest group are from Yorkshire and Humber. But in the northwest, the greatest number of members are from the larger trusts. So I know Claire Maguire and I have been um, comparing notes as to who's got the most members from our respective organisations, but we're kind of almost <coughs> level pegging. But the new Greater Manchester Mental Health Trust is catching up with us fairly quickly. And then all have over 200 members. Um, and Cheshire and Wirral, Mersey Care and North West Boroughs are also around about the 125 mark. The largest professional group who are members are psychological wellbeing practitioners. So I think that's well done, Liz and colleagues for making that happen, followed by clinical psychologists, cognitive behavior therapists and counselors. And I think it really, really reflects the fact that we're a multi-professional network um, for psychological professionals and we want to include everyone. So, and I think other things to mention, we've entered a new phase in development, so we're hosting projects around liaison mental health as well as assistant practitioners, and I think that demonstrates that we're recognised as a mature and competent body now to kind of manage these big projects with money attached to them, and we've also been successful in a bid to host a project looking at developing a comprehensive user-friendly information hub describing the work of psychological professions. So that will be good if we can get it together because there's a lot of complex information associated with that. Some of you will be aware that we were also asked to host an event around the future professional representation of clinical psychology. I think one of, one of the interesting things that, that's happened over the years with the Psychological Professions Network is perhaps we came, originally there used to be a meeting of perhaps senior clinical psychologists in the region, and that's perhaps much less of a feature now. And there's a bit of a gap these days. And some of you, probably mostly clinical psychologists in the room, will have been aware of some of the perhaps tensions between the representation of clinical psychologists by the Division of Clinical Psychology, which is part of the British Psychological Society, and the British Psychological Society's view of itself as perhaps more of a learned society. And that's presented some difficulties. So we were really chuffed actually to ask to host a debate where we some of those, um, I suppose, points of view and hearing from a range of voices was, was important. So three weeks ago, the PPN hosted an event which was live streamed. Um, some of you have seen this, some of you have attended. The panel showcased a range of views. So from the BPS, from the Division of Clinical Psychology, a new professional organization called the Association of Clinical Psychologists, as well as perspectives from minorities in clinical psychology training, psychologists of social justice, an independent psychologist, and someone who was no longer a BPS member for reasons that they'd um, elaborated on and hadn't been for quite some time. And we also had a service user perspective and I think that widened the debate quite significantly. There was a lively con Twitter contribution too, and I, think, I don't think Steve Weatherhead's here today, but it was expertly organized by him, so I think we're very grateful for that. We also heard that training courses as far away as um, Devon and Humberside organized evening events to watch it. Some, I think, believe that they watched it with pizza, which wasn't an option open to the panel members, sadly, but you know, you can't have everything. Um, so, but I think it's really stimulated a wider conversation about the need to include diverse perspectives and also to consider the role of clinical psychologists within the community and not wholly within sort of traditional healthcare settings. I think I'm also really pleased that we actually recognise the futures about, you know, graduate psychologists aspiring to become healthcare workers or psycho clinical psychologists, assistant psychologists gaining experience in those in training as well as those newly qualified because they are the future of the profession. I may not be standing here in 20 years' time, you probably wouldn't want me to, but I really, really hope that some of the people that were perhaps part of that debate or in the audience today will be taking over that role in terms of what psychological professions can actually offer. 
What was really good was there was around 1,200 views of that live stream in the first week, with around about a further 50 in the second week. And I think that's sort of real recognition about our impact, and I think it's been a new step for PPN in terms of actually engaging with technology, getting anxious about it working, feeling more relieved that it worked, and thinking, right, perhaps we could maybe think about doing this again at some point. Okay. And I think the other thing to note is that the psychological well-being practitioners have also gone from strength to strength. So there was a conference in Sheffield with huge input from PWPs in the northwest, but certainly across the country in the northeast and the north as well. And Liz Kell, who's the chair of the PWP group and a member of the Workforce Board, is also now chair of the BABCP, or the British Association for Behavioural and Cognitive Psychotherapy, Low Intensity Group. So congratulations, which is great. And we've got a sibling now. I wasn't quite sure how to describe the new Kent, Surrey and Sussex Psychological Professions Network, which is in the process of launching. The model's been of PPN's actually been adopted around there, and Adrian Whittington and Alice Plummer were working, Claire and I are working with them, excuse me, <coughs> to share our experience and support their development and also to learn from them. So I don't think there's any sibling rivalry. I think we're really, really going to be able to work together. And we're also looking at collaboration, how actually there's going to be a single, perhaps wider PPN voice in terms of our influence and actually shouting about a multi-professional workforce. So last year, for those of you who are here, I talked about being three and what three-year-olds should be able to do. So now we're four, what should we be able to do? Apparently an average four-year-old should be able to stand on one foot for 10 seconds or longer. I'm not going to demonstrate, so don't, <laughs> don't build your hopes up. You could try at the break if you want. Um, and hop and somersault. And apparently four-year-olds become more sociable and independent, amongst other things such as increasing imagination, energy, drive, and bossiness. So hopefully we're not becoming too bossy. But I'd like to think we're demonstrating our sociability with these projects that we're getting involved in. And I think also our independence in terms of our voice is being heard more widely, the model we offer is being sort of adopted more widely. And I think just generally the energy, drive and imagination that brings us together and over a hundred of you in a room today in terms of the work of the network. So moving on in terms of perhaps thinking more about today, times are changeable, might be a cliche, but it's probably fairly typical of where we're all, we all are. And I'm sure we've all experienced uncertainty in our lives over the past year. That might be in relation to work roles and the constant change that seems to be part of the NHS these days. There's uncertainties about the future too. And I think our European colleagues experience additional uncertainties with the Brexit plans, if that's what they are. Um, and there's also uncertainties about training funding. It's not yet clear what change will be to our training as clinical psychologists, high intensity therapists or psychological well-being practitioners, but with the push in other professions to go to a model where individuals pay for training as via student loans, it seems likely there will be less support than there has been. But what the shape of that support I don't think is clear. And I think with the five year forward view report and the recent Health Education England Workforce Plan, the growth and development of both current and new roles it's a, potentially an opportunity, but it's also a challenge. And I think it's important for us to think, as a network to think about how we can work with those. I think the other thing that I suppose I've possibly struggled with a bit more is the move towards local planning with the sustainability and transformation partnerships. Um, we need to consider how, as a wider network covering a whole area, how we engage and promote the importance of psychological approaches and professions in our local areas. So where some of you are engaged with that, we'd really like to hear from you. And where some of you are not, we'd really like to work with you to think about how we can start making inroads into to those worlds. We'll be talking more about workforce and learning from Health Education England in the North about the workforce plan and considering how we can contribute to this. But I'll let Claire explain all those bits for later. So the morning, um, I mean, obviously, as you're aware, Manchester experienced a terror attack resulting death, injury, and the experience of trauma with its psychological impact. This has been a challenging time for all, and some of you may have had direct experience, some of you will have had indirect experience, some of you have had professional experience of working with people affected, either in the immediate days after or more recently with the, with the Manchester hub. And I think while the event in Manchester 
you know, took place six months ago, its impact's been felt more widely across the northwest, across the country. There's been other awful events taking place in London, and these have had an impact, I think, on all of us. So directly, indirectly, personal and professionally. So this morning we're going to focus on trauma and perhaps learn more about the work of our colleagues in responding to the Manchester Arena bombing with the work of the, the Resilience Hub. But before that, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Noreen Tirani from the British Psychological Society's Crisis, Disaster and Trauma Psychological Section. <laughs> said that without breathing. Um, she brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with us, and that includes people who have experienced trauma, whether it's large-scale trauma, as we've seen in Manchester, um, or individual experience, which might be featured in terms of some of our clinical work, as well as working with first responders in relation to both primary and secondary trauma. So I think, so sort of join me in thinking we've got a fantastic day planned, and I'm delighted to, to welcome you all here. Okay.